which is good. All right, everybody. Happy Wednesday, August the 7th. Welcome to Is It Time to Quit Tech? Discover Other Careers Worth a Look. My name is Albert of Albert's List, and I'll be your host today. And we're here to tell you to actually answer the question that you signed up for in this event. And it comes on the heels of a lot of different things happening in the industry, as specifically in the tech industry this year. We just saw that Dell laid off 12,500 people. Uh, Intel's about to lay off 15,000. Intuit laid off 1,800. And it's been a steady drumbeat that's been pretty much going on for this entire year. And if you work in tech, you have no doubt felt the whiplash, the fear, and everything in between. And so it may make you ask, is it time to look for something different? And where do you start if you're looking for something different anyway? Because there's so many things out there in the world. Well, as the founder of Albert's List, I'm here to help at least get you on some kind of journey to wherever that next step may be. I brought in four amazing, distinguished panelists today to talk about that very topic of where you could go next. I'm going to have them introduce themselves in a little bit of detail here in a moment, but basically, it's Michelle Ta, who is a user experience designer in the mental health industry, Alexander Quebec, who works in banking and finance as a personal uh, financial counselor, Josh Beatty, who works as a marketing director in the health and wellness industry, and finally, Yash Voltaire, who works in the oil and gas field. You're more than welcome to ask your questions using the Q&A function. This webinar is being recorded, so you can come back later if you have any burning questions or thoughts or insights that you really, really wanted to ask. And we will send you that recorded link on our YouTube channel, which I'll share here in a moment uh, in the next day or so. So panelists, welcome. It's great to have you here. We're excited to have this engaging, exhilarating, and very insightful conversation today. I'm going to actually just kick it off by having you talk about who you are, what field you work in, and uh, anything that you think our panelists should know today. So Michelle, I'm going to start with you. I'm the first victim. Look at that. Um, so <laughs> it's so good to meet you all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, a little bit about me. So I am Michelle. I work as a UI UX designer for the past five, over five years. I've worked in SaaS agency work um, in the span throughout like college and into my adulthood. Um, and then you may have seen, but I also run a nonprofit, so called Agent Connections Hub. Um, so it's like a online directory space to connect um, other organizations and other individuals to stick together and bridge those communities together through networking, programming, um, and all kinds of fun events as well. So it's a little bit fun. Awesome. awesome. Uh, Alex, I'll have you go next. Hey everyone, my name is Alex Quebec, or you, I go by Alexander, but I really, it's Alex Quebec. I have been in actually working for one of the Bay Area's largest credit unions for over seven years in different capacities. My most recent uh, recent role right now, I'm actually a certified financial specialist, which I kind of explained a little bit earlier, but it is mostly like a credit counselor, uh, coaching around savings, uh, future planning for my members, and just helping them kind of develop their financial well-being to where they can live confidently uh, with regards to their finances. So getting people kind of set up for success uh, in that regard. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you're next. Hey, I'm Yash Voltaire. So I'm a, oh, I'm sorry, was it Josh or Yash? Ooh. Uh, Yash. Close. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Yash Voltaire. Um, I'm a director of HR for an oil and gas company here in Houston. And um, I will say some of my experience out here kind of goes on both fields. So I used to work for Deloitte Consulting for about six years prior to this. And most of my work over there was in the field of um, talent development or like talent management programs and initiatives being rolled out and primarily for tech companies and oil and gas. So I transitioned over about a year ago and oil and gas has kind of been my go-to. Um, I will say that there are a lot of different transitions taking place in the field at the moment. And one of the things that attracted me to it, so happy to talk about that at some point in time and hopefully answer some questions about what a career is like in oil and gas compared to tech. Awesome. And then Josh. All right. Thanks for having me, Albert. Um, so I've been a marketer, I have to think back for 18 years now. Uh, I'm 38. So I started it when I was in 20 in college. Uh, my first career Part of my career was in manufacturing, went to university marketing from there, did some local agency marketing uh, during grad school, 
from that point, uh, that's right around when I met Albert, actually, way back in like 2010. Um, from that point, um, I went into D2C kind of e-commerce um, marketing, and then I went into the health and wellness industry in 2016, where I've been the last eight and a half years, roughly speaking. And then as of this year, I started a new role in a dietary supplement manufacturing company. So I lead the charge there as the corporate director of marketing. And so, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to be here to answer questions. Um, I have a varied background, but uh, I really like this industry I've been in. There's a lot of stability and that's something that I really liked. And so I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So I think stability is something that definitely resonates with a lot of people who work in tech because most people who work in tech don't have that stability given that companies exist on a quarter to quarter basis where uh, they are living and dying by the stock market or they are living and dying by whether their company gets any funding to get to the next round. And so I think I always correlate stability as well with opportunity. And that's actually going to be the basis for my next question. As tech moves into a different life cycle, given high interest rates and given maybe this greater focus on AI, uh, it's always interesting to see where do, and by the way, we will talk about AI in a moment, so hold those questions. Um, we want to know, like, what are the opportunities specifically in your industry for people who may be interested to break in from tech? And what do some of those opportunities look like? We heard some of you folks mention transition, uh, growth, and so forth. And so I'm going to start with Josh to answer this question. Josh with a J. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So for the last part of the questions, like if, you, if you're wanting to transition from tech to something else, um, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be change. I'll tell you that I was a person that wanted to get into tech <laughs> years ago. However, we could tell you that um, I tried and I tried and I tried and it just didn't work out. Um, but I think the flip side is, is a little more uh, welcoming if I could say so. And I think that there's opportunity out there for tech people that even though you might not think it's there, it's there, especially if you have transferable skill sets. Um, so like, for example, if you're really good at numbers and you're like some data kind of analyst, you know, if you were to go into even like what I'm doing now, manufacturing, you could find yourself as a supply chain analyst. You could find yourself as a planner, a master scheduler. Like these are jobs that do pay like six figures. Um, depending on where you are in the country, like you can make, you know, anywhere. And if you're in the middle of the country, probably like 60 to 100, you know, if you're in coastal areas like California, where I'm at, you know, you look at anywhere from like 85 to 130, 140. Um, I don't know what it'd be like up in the Bay Area, but, you know, so there, there's, there's opportunity, there's transferable um, opportunities. I'm the kind of person that if I were, you know, if I was at a point of growing my team, I would look at tech. Like, I know there's a lot of things that people are capable of and like industry to some extent can be taught. Like you don't have to have domain industry in every single kind of role. So make sure that you don't let that like mentally hold you back because you can take a lot of things and turn them upside down, you know, in another place. And you can come with a lot of great things and surprise the company. And like some of these industries, especially manufacturing, some of them can be really old school. And you're coming in, you're coming to all these are like, wow, you know, you can all do all this stuff while let's do it. Like some places are open to that. Like they, they want to get out of their, their old ways. There's a lot of companies across this country that have been doing the same thing for 50, 60 years in manufacturing. And they're looking for innovation. They're, they're looking for new ways to do something. They're looking ways to optimize, you know, whatever you're doing. If you're a software engineer, they're looking for ways to, you know, find the more technical way to do it and track those kind of things. Like they're, we're working on, you know, spreadsheets still, what well, can you implement a new system? You know, those kind of things. Can you implement a new software that they've never been able to do before while their line people are working, you know, out in the plant, you know, there, there's certain needs that they have. And so, you know, those are a few things that come to mind. Awesome. Uh, Yash. So I want to talk about exactly what Josh talked about over here, but relatable to oil and gas. And I completely agree with all the roles that he mentioned. Supply chain roles are huge. And I want to talk about oil and gas for a moment as well, because oil and gas can be um, an, it can be an, um, 
it's a field that's unique in many ways, but with the transition that's taking place at the moment, you have a lot of reliance on technology. So some of you may have heard of what's called the SCADA. SCADA is the supervisory controls and that, that acquisition. So this is a network um, that has not existed for very long. It's existed for about 10 or 15 years. Uh, there's a lot of security that goes into it. There's a lot of programming, a lot of coding, and in general, just a lot of network infrastructure. None of this has been present in the oil and gas field. And what I've been able to kind of, um, and I have a list of about five roles that have been very successful, both in my company and, and two of the major companies in Houston uh, from a successful transition standpoint. But what I've kind of noticed so far is um, we had a very natural change in folks that had been laid off from tech companies in Texas. So we had a lot of folks that relocated from California to Texas and then were subsequently laid off. What ended up happening out there is oil and gas was able to scoop up uh, a lot of this talent. And shockingly, there's been an over-reliance on technology now as a result of that. So if I think about some of the major transitions taking place, it's oil and gas is now more technology oriented than they ever have been before, both from a talent standpoint, as well as a strategy standpoint, when we think about some of the vice presidents and higher that have come into the organization. Amazing. Alex. Yes. So, I mean, I could talk about what I do in the work in the credit union, but I mean, it is under the larger umbrella of financial services. So you have to realize with financial services, it's an industry that has millions of people employed throughout the U.S., trillions of dollars in capital, capital every, in different companies. The four, bank, the four biggest banks alone are about nine trillion, you know, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo and Citibank. OK, and you don't have to go very far to see the influence that's in the, the financial institutions have in your day life. Open your wallet, see who's in there. You can name you can at least name one person in there or name one name or name one bank in there. And definitely, I would say just like there's opportunity in tech for different kind of roles. Same thing in financial financial services. There's like what Josh had said earlier, we definitely need analytical thinkers. We de definitely need problem solvers. You know, we definitely need, we definitely need innovation in, in our industry. And I think the tech people have that, uh, have that infusion of new blood that I think this industry needs to kind of give you an idea. I mean, financial services have been around since we've been using gold coin, uh, basically gold coins or even earlier than that. I mean, to give you an idea of how, kind of antiquated this industry can be sometimes. Mortgage industry is still using fax machines. I mean, <laughs> we're still using fax machines for some of our things. We are, we just are. And I think the tech, I think, I think our industry definitely is starting to see, I think it's just maybe within the last 15, 20 years, they're just seeing how valuable tech people are, you know, because you also have this industry that's huge. And it's so huge that you have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer approval to do anything. I mean, it depends on the company, of course. You know, a large big four versus like a, a regional bank or a credit union like mine, for example, maybe it takes less time. But I mean, definitely their opportunities are there. And in fact, you don't even have to leave tech if you don't want to. Maybe you're tired of working in tech, in a tech company. You want to work tech, but somewhere else. You know, I'll pre go to pretty much any institution. You know, they have, uh, they, they definitely have a tech role out there for you. I mean, the vibe might be different, you know, depending on what tech company you were coming from. It might not be like the Silicon Valley, anything goes kind of attitude that, you know, we had when we first, you know, when tech start, first started blowing up, you know, you have a very traditional environment. There's a lot of structure um, on top of that, because our industry is heavily regulated by the federal government. You know, there are rules that you have to follow. But I mean, if you're OK with making that transition, if you're OK with a little bit having a little bit more structure, be, not because we want to have it but because we have to then i think that definitely the opportunity is there and even if like let's say you know people forget that there are sales people in tech you know people forget that you know the sales the sales ability translates very well to financial services especially when you think about all the investment advisors that a lot of the aging population is going to need in the next few years to advise them on how to kind of maximize the returns on their retirement funds you know so when you consider that the earning potential is very high for those people anywhere in the six figures, of course, there are licensing and testing involved, of course. But when you consider when you take that into consideration, short answer is yes, there are opportunities. There's a lot and it can get overwhelming. But I think as and I, and I coach my members in the change process, I mean, the fact that all of you are here in this meeting, it says that you're addressing the problem. I don't want to be in tech anymore. You know, or I, I want to change careers. So that's the first step. 
The second step now is what we call discussing alternatives is that pretty much that's what we're doing today. And that's where you need to sit down and say, look, okay, so I don't want to be in tech to find the problem. What do I want to do? Okay, what are my alternatives? So we're at that stage right now, the problem solving uh, or the the cycle, the change, the change cycle uh, process that I go through my clients. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Michelle. Yeah, so I think there's so much opportunity in tech and I resonate a lot with what everybody else said too, especially, you know, as a designer myself, like I came from like a whole different background of like front end development, I did a little bit of back end and then like I taught myself those things and then I branched into like um, design, website design, graphic design, tried different things, seeing if tech was my thing or more design, more creative focus. And I feel like, you know, as you break into tech, as you try different things, there's a lot of transferable skills and kind of what everybody else said too, like for example i've seen like people in design you know within my industry like you know they'll start with a designer they'll go into like i don't know healthcare they'll go into different things they'll try different things different roles within design but it's not really like oh i want to do it with the technical side but i want to do a bit more of the other stuff so um there's different roles like ux researchers or ui designers ux designers or if you're coming you're like i don't want to do design anymore i don't want to do like sort of tech thing but you could be a little bit less technical but still you know do something within the tech industry there's like product managers and i've seen people kind of branch into that as well so there's a lot of opportunity for you to kind of try different things do different things and being so young like i'm still so young, I'm probably the most baby here. Um, but you know, <laughs> I've tried different things and I've done a whole span of weird things like HR, I've done financial stuff, I've done a little bit of SaaS, and then all these different things. And so I would say just be open to those opportunities and be open to trying new things. And especially for my like career-wise, like I don't really have like the special degree that you need to break into design. You don't really need that degree. I think if you have, you know, the skills to problem solve, be creative and being able to break into new things that will kind of help you progress in your career, then try those things. It doesn't hurt to try. If you don't try, then you're never going to know. So always kind of push forward and keep trying. Like for me, I'm still figuring things out. I'm still kind of guessing. And if I want to be a product manager one day, if I want to do design still, and over five years of spanning, I'm doing those things. There's a lot of opportunity for you to try different things. So don't hold yourself back from it, but be open to that change and be open to trying new things. You don't really need that degree. I think, you know, as designers, I don't see people have the degree. I didn't even get the special UI UX design degree or go for a master's in human computer interaction. So you don't need that either. As long as you have the passion and you have the work to show that you can do the job, then you have and you have that ability to move forward. So I think that's something you should try. Awesome. I love it. And I see I'm seeing the questions come into the Q&A. Uh, for the panelists, some of those questions are directed at uh, some of you directly. So feel free to uh, type your answer in. I know, Yash, you're already in there typing away. Uh, but the next question I want to talk about is actually very much related to some of these questions and, that, that are coming in. And I think that um, we've touched on it a little bit, and that's transferable skills and sort of by extension, transferable roles, right? So if I'm a product marketing manager in tech, what does that look like in your industry? If I'm a... Um, product manager, how does that translate over and so forth? And do such things exist or am I looking at completely revamping my resume overall? And I've seen this question come through a few times. So I definitely want to ask that. And basically the question is, what kind of roles should you look for uh, if you have the basic uh, tech stack of different roles? What does that look like from a, uh, what does that look like in your industry in terms of transferable roles? And then also let's talk about transferable skills. If somebody can launch a product in tech or manage a product or uh, do some coding or software engineering um, or is able to look through Google Analytics and understand those metrics, how do those skills um, come through and, uh, and can be impactful on the other side? So Michelle, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, of course. I'm sorry for the background noise. If you hear, it's just my babies, my doggies. Um, so <laughs> a little bit <laughs> being a dog mom is hard. <laughs> anyway, I apologize. Um, so with kind of product management and UI UX, like if there's a lot of different ways, like you know, if you start as a designer, for example, you can kind of take your understanding of UI UX design and that design thinking process, the UX research process, all the way to UX design and UI design. So there's a lot of different things you can try a lot of different things that you can break into. If you understand that process, you understand what design is and you understand what 
you know, those things mean when it comes to designing a product from start to finish, working with engineers, working with product managers, other product owners and stakeholders, then you can kind of take that understanding and push into, you know, product management. For me, um, if you know, you know, being able to like manage a product, being able to defend your design decisions, being able to kind of push for strategy and being able to push for KPIs, so different things, then you can also transfer those skills together in product management. And for me, I've seen products from start to finish. I've done things start to finish. I've launched a product last year before I was laid off, unfortunately. But being able to see that from start to finish within six months, I did it within six months. I've done things within a year. I've done things within the span of a few months. And so those things can always be like challenging to see, especially when it comes like, do I kind of have the skills to kind of transfer into product management or other different like things or even software engineering. I've seen designers go from, you know, designing like kind of what I do and then they go to engineering. And so there's different things you can kind of transfer as long as you kind of understand kind of that process and how, you know, handoff works. How does it go from start to finish? And so there's opportunity to do that, but also opportunity to kind of see that whole process as being like, if, as a designer, I kind of see it like just kind of start to finish when it comes to talking to stakeholders, figuring out the business requirements and then going into that whole entire process of, basically launching something or even like a feature or whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of opportunity for product managers. You know, if they want to go back to design, you can, because if you understand that process, understand working closely with other engineers and also managing designers and working closely on the strategy of things, you can go back and design or you can kind of go flip flop. So there's different opportunity there. And it's, it's very interesting to kind of see the products I've designed and they're very complicated. They're very easy or they're very um, more complex or certain like kind of industries and audiences. And so, um, it's it's interesting for what I've experienced. So, awesome, uh, Yash. So I'm going to talk to uh, maybe the five roles I've seen that have transitioned most effectively from um, people that had tech jobs previously to HR. So, or I'm sorry, to oil and gas. So from an HR standpoint, I have access to some of this data and I reached out to a couple of peers before this right here to see what it was like at their organization. So these are all companies based out of Houston, one in Austin. And um, these are the five roles that we came up with. So one is product management. And I think uh, Michelle has hit this one pretty well. Um, I think we have a good overview of what that is. So I'm going to kind of skip that. But that has been one of the most successful ones. And that goes by retention rights. We've had project managers, change management specialists, and business analysts. So those are kind of the four. The business analyst kind of divides into two. One is someone that would be very technical in nature. And then one is someone who is essentially dealing with the data side of things. Um, so I kind of want to say like this has been a need in oil and gas as well. And I would say there's people from oil and gas that are shaping what this field looks like at the moment, not just in oil and gas specifically, but in energy as a whole. Um, so if you're looking for translatable skills, um, that's kind of it. If you're looking for translatable job titles, that's kind of it. And uh, I do get the question a lot around how do you make your resume relevant to a job like this? And I'm, I think we are going to talk about that later on. Because it is a very popular question, but honestly, ChatGPT is going to be one of your greatest friends on something like this. Just to be able to type in and share your resume and what translatable skills to a target job, it's going to come up with a great response for you. That's going to be better than any resume updater can provide. Yeah. Alex. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So this is a little story about a, uh, the manager that originally hired me at the telco and, or the credit union I work at, sorry. Um, he actually was my branch manager for a while. Then he made a transition and suddenly now he's a product manager. So to give you kind of an idea of whether or not you can transition, short answer, yes, you definitely can. We have uh, product management positions open. We have product management positions in our company and a lot of institutions that deal with the public, I mean, definitely have a need for those, you know, for those product management roles. You know, you have, you know, but the, of course the end game is, you're seeing you're creating products that will be utilized by your members or your 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 customers or whoever they may be. So definitely, you know, definitely that transition that transition is there. It's it's it exists. Um, there's also definitely tech roles open as well in most institutions. I mean, you go to I I like to go to the HR pages of other institutions. I mean, the same similar roles apply similar roles that you'd find at any tech company. You'll definitely find working for a large, large institution. Uh, I, I bet again, there's, and also there's opportunities for you to try to move into different things, you know? Um, you see, if you're like a salesperson, I mean, definitely, 
I was mentioning, I was mentioning investment, investment advisor. Of course, that does take some time, you know, some time because you have to basically take a couple tests and exams, which they will pretty much uh, expect you to fail the first time and maybe the second time. Uh, there is a third time and that's it. The series six and the series seven, if you're not familiar with those, what those are, or you could be a mortgage lender and go get your mortgage license, and go into that space too. Um, if you do those transitions though, they might ask you to do some other stuff along the way, you know, you might have to basically start up at the bottom again, but again, if that's something that kind of appeals to you, they, there, there is lots of earning potential, probably not so mortgage right now, uh, but definitely around uh, investments. So it just depends on uh, how much, how much work and effort you want to put into that to, to see, to see it through. Because again, the series six and the series seven, uh, they're very tough tests. They actually said, I think it's like the series six, there's a 65% pass rate on first timers. But again, and I and I tell people like, yeah, if you don't pass the first time, they know, they get it. They're like, sure. <laughs> so, but definitely the transferable skills that you would find at any job and especially people skills. A lot of people forget that there are people skills when you're working people's money. Those are important because we people forget money has a very like logical, mathematical, very kind of methodical thing to it. But as someone who loses, as some of you who may have lost a little bit of money in the stock market in, over the last few days, there's also an emotional component to it too. <laughs> so being able to read the room, being able to kind of gauge what your, what your client or what your member is saying or what your customer base is saying or what they're feeling and being able to kind of the emotional intelligence, being able to kind of look at that and say, huh, maybe that's not a good recommendation or you know what, maybe I'll make that recommendation instead that's going to be super important in this, in this industry in believe it or not love it josh all right uh, i'm going to talk from more specifically into the marketing kind of segment of things um i know in the tech world there is these kind of stair cases of roles you know pr product marketing manager senior product marketing manager director of product marketing group director of product market like it's like these types of roles that you see in like eight, like marketing agencies, you, there's like this ladder to climb. But if you get out of tech, you, you're probably going to find a different kind of world where your pro idea of product marketing is going to be more broad. Um, you know, I'll kind of speak from my own personal experience. So, you know, as, as my role in my role as a corporate marketing director, I kind of do a bit of everything. I'm a generalist in nature, but like I'm, I'm doing the product marketing. I, I came in, to a company that hasn't had marketing they've been around for 65 years doing really well as a company but they've been very sales focused and so like as a non-tech marketer i was still able to come in you know and have a, a large impact i'm having a large impact I, i've worked on the go-to market strategy totally revamping it i've worked on our core messaging dialing down our key differentiators our positioning like completely taken the company we're a company about 500 people so you know taking the company in a whole new direction of who we are as a company like our our strategic narrative designing that um even i'm even in the process of rolling out a complete rebranding like the company's been around for a long time they've had this dated look and they were like please come in and take us to the next century like you're gonna find companies out there in the united states that have been doing the same thing for 50 60 years but they need to look fresh they need to be fresh so it might speak to a designer, a creative director that's been in tech, where you can go into a, one of these companies and they're, they're going to be chomping at the bit for your skills. Um, you know, like they, that's why they, they they found me. They're like, we've been doing the same thing for 50, 60 years and we need some change. Well, they kind of swooped me up, you know, once they found me on LinkedIn. Um, not only are you going to work on like the messaging and you know the product marketing side, but you also work in the techie stuff. Like I'm rebuilding a website. I'm launching it here in about five to six weeks. It's about to go in development. And I've only been there like, three months and I'm a team of one. So I only have very part-time like freelance help kind of helping me on the side. So I'm doing all of this myself. And so I get to have a big impact in this kind of company. Um, being the only marketer in a company of 500 plus employees, you know, on that end, I'm also doing event marketing. So we have a big trade show that's we have every um, October in Las Vegas. So working on trade booth design, event planning, logistics of that, getting, you know, sales collateral, all readied up for our sales team. So lots of you're working with sales, you know, doing sales enablement as well. 
Um, and, you know, there's the social media component. I haven't really worked on that yet because I've been working on the company foundation, but there's a plan for that. So you can work in social. Those kind of companies need a creative way to work and show what they're doing. If you're a videographer and you're wondering, like, what can I do? And well, in a manufacturing company, you're you. It's very boring in a sense that like you just think things are going through a machine. But like if you can make it look cool and you can find the right content, find the right angles, be able to tell the story of like what you're doing, what your capabilities are in a visual kind of way, that helps a lot. So if you're a videographer, a photographer, like you could have a place in that type of uh, company. Um, even from that point, um, you know, if if you know you're a writer, you're you're a copywriter, yeah, you're gonna need to write ads. We'll be doing LinkedIn marketing. You know, I'm going to be doing the targeting, you know, ABM, whatever you want to call it on the tech side. I don't really call it that. I just call it all marketing. But um, there's a lot of opportunity. There, There's things for every marketer. You're just going to see different types of role names. So don't let those scare you if it doesn't follow kind of your, your perceived course in tech. It might say content manager. It might say marketing manager, and it's very broad. Don't let that scare you because that a lot of times that's going to give you opportunity to flex in other areas that you haven't yet. And I'm seeing, I've been seeing the trend that marketing generalists are the future in a way going forward. And we'll not get into the AI just yet, but like AI is going to be able to do specific things, be your specialist. You need to be a generalist in enough sense that you can understand what's going on full picture. So you can kind of have that 50,000 foot view and you can be the strategist and then be able to look down and be like, all right, I need this, I need this, I need this, this tech can do that. You know, like the AI is going to do certain things, but we still need the human eye. You still need the human thought, the creative thought that's going to make things happen in motion and the way that's going to strike um, from a marketing perspective to get your strategic narrative out there and make things happen. And I could go on and on, but I'll kind of like share it up right there with that. All good. I think that's fantastic. And uh, we're almost to the end of this first section of the of this panel because I wanted to spend a little bit of time on transferable skills and job hunting before we get into the thing that maybe everybody wanted to be here for. But there's one more question I wanted to ask before that. And so, you know, as we look into our transferable skills, our transferable roles, how do we play that into our job search overall? So in your industries, do people get in via referral? Can you blindly apply on LinkedIn or Indeed? Um, do you need certifications? How do how how do these things help you stand out uh, in terms of being able to make that transition and to be able to showcase your level of domain knowledge so that you don't appear like a deer in headlights on day one? Uh, Josh, I'm going to start with you for this one. Josh, okay, Josh, Josh with a J. All right, sounds good. All right, um, <laughs> I, I will say. You know, I'll speak from my industry specifically. Um, I I think that I work in health and wellness, whatever that means, like nutraceuticals, supplements, that could be beverage, food, whatever, that the whole natural products kind of sector. Um, I'll say that those companies are very welcoming to outside industries if you have like certain hard skills. Now, it's always a plus to have domain knowledge and it always helps to have, you know, if you have a specific kind of, you know, expertise and what you would like to go into, you know, it might be more difficult on the higher, like, like say, you know, C-suite kind of levels and that, that kind of aspect, but it's not always the case, but you, you can get in there. Um, I think in terms of kind of getting your foot in the door, sometimes having a good LinkedIn account is the way into something like, I think that headhunters are open to finding people. If you have a, a dialed up account and you know how to display your skill set in different ways, you know, specific things you've worked on. If you have examples of work or like media mentions that you've talked in other, you know, magazines or articles, you know, or whatever, showing diverse ways of showing your skill set is important. So if you know how to talk with people within your in, in your industry, they're going to be like, well, this person can probably talk in our industry if they're doing it there, you know. Like, so finding the ways to, I'm going to say it's, it's very transferable. Like, I, it's not like trying to get into tech from the other side, I think. I think like it's just a complete opposite. Like there's a lot of like open arms in a lot of sense. And like, I would look for a, a tech marketer. You know, I, I noticed, you know, in the past when I've done hiring, like I don't really, I've never really got 
tech marketers, you know, applying for jobs that I was, um, you know, hiring for. But if I ever saw one, like they'd be one of the first people I look for. Cause I'm like, I know they know these technical things, you know, I'm like, I can teach them the industry. I, I can mentor, you know, what we do at my company, for example. But, you know, if there's a certain skill set that's very deep, you know, and I need a specialist in something, even though I think generalist is the way to go, like I'm open to that as a kind of a hiring manager, um, you know, so like that's probably what I would do in my first couple of hires is finding specialists when I do end up growing my team. And I'm going to look for certain skills that are deep in certain areas for at least a while. And then I'll be able to let that person do what they do really well in the beginning, for example. And then I'll if I need to mentor them in the other areas of disciplines of marketing to kind of round them out um, to be able to take on more than what they came in for over time. And, you know, as a result, get them paid more. Um, I'm of the mindset, at least kind of within my industry, we want to see people grow. We want to see people get paid well. We want to hire from with promote from with, from within whenever we do, whenever we can. And so if we get those people early, you know, it doesn't matter where you're in your career, but, I think if we get people early, even in their career, they can they can make a big difference. So that's a few things I think about. Awesome. Alex, <clears throat> you're on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so going kind of back to my original, original point, it really just depends on how you kind of want to approach it. I mean, you can approach the castle from like just a lateral move, like you decide, you know what, I'm, a, I'm, I don't want to be in tech, but I still want to be in my same field. Fine. You know, you can apply pretty much anywhere that has that position open. I mean, just that that's the, the easiest and the most direct way. Of course, depending on the company that you're going to be applying for, you know, like a regional bank versus a large big four um, net networking will definitely help you get these roles. I mean, cause I, I definitely see a lot of my peers who move from, from different roles to different roles uh kind of give you an example i have a friend of mine he's a mortgage lender he works in mortgages uh he's getting most of his jobs just by referrals you know he goes to the events you know he started at wells fargo uh they paid for his college then after they were he's done with commitment he went to chase went with them for a little bit was with us bank for about two months and then now he's with pnc but he got a lot of those jobs definitely through networking and of course he does have his you know his certification stuff like that so a lot of those jobs do require some level of networking, especially because you got to remember the industry that I'm in is very much established. It's very much, and depending on how, where, how high you want to go, it's very established. You know, there have these networks of people who've been in the industry. There's probably people been in there like, as, like I'm the second generation of my family doing this, you know? So you have these kind of these strong networks of, of people you kind of have to work through. Uh, I also have an approach uh, where people who sometimes start at the bottom all over again, you know, like I've actually met people, a lot of my, um, I met someone who went from being just a basic teller at a institution, you know, they you know doing transactions day in, day out, and they worked their way up to becoming part of the investment team. You know, it took a while, but they got there. It just, again, it just comes down to the level of patience that you have for your transition, the ability for your, the, 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 the willingness to take on kind of the learning experience, because again, you know, there's certifications required, but most institutions will pay for that. You know, they'll pay for you to take that exam uh it's uh series seven is 300 dollars each time by the way so um that's and you know if you fail at once you know they got to pay a ticket again take it spend another 300 bucks uh they'll pay for your certifications if you don't have it but of course if you have it already great um but yeah it just you know just it, you just have to decide how you want to approach it what makes the most sense for you you know like are you willing to are you are you willing to do the net play the networking game and kind of you know, schmooze around a little bit, talk to Pete, talk to the right people and hopefully land where you want to go right then and there. Or are you willing to start from the bottom all over again? And some people are in, you know, and I, and I don't, I don't fault anyone who decides that they want to do that. You know, they want to start way at the bottom again. I mean, I've met, I have this kind of a similar vein. I've met friends who left tech to go to nursing. And of course that meant going back to school going back to long hours inside the classroom. And then even after the classroom was done, they still had to do all their other stuff too, to get their certification, get their license. So in a broader sense, I guess it just depends on, especially when you, especially when you, depending on the industry, it just depends on where, how you want to approach it and where you want to start and what you're willing to kind of go through to make it happen. Yes. 
Okay, so for oil and gas, um, and I can kind of talk to you both consulting and oil and gas, um, but for oil and gas specifically, I pulled some numbers and just to kind of put things in perspective over here, um, I do agree with everything that's been said. Like you've got to figure out how you want to approach your time. Um, for oil and gas specifically, we had 61% of our new hires in the last two years um, as a result of referrals. So these were employee referrals. These people already worked in our organization. And I think that might track to what you know about oil and gas. That's the way how uh, that's how we got into this company as well. It was uh, via referral from someone I've worked with previously on a project when I was with Deloitte. Um, the 20% um, were LinkedIn applications. So these are people that just apply via LinkedIn, like easy apply or something, whatever it was. Um, the remainder were miscellaneous. So if you kind of break that down, like most of ours are referrals. And if you break down referrals for a moment as well, like these were as a result of networking. These are people that either express an interest for a job or there was someone at my company that reached out to these folks because we had openings. So I would say that should be your primary route if you do want to get into the energy oil and gas industry. Um, and I will kind of deviate for a moment as well and say uh, that's something that I think is very personal. So for me, I have always had more success from a networking standpoint. I enjoy meeting people. I enjoy that process. I enjoy mixers. I attend a lot of them. I always keep in touch with people that left my company. Um, it's, it's one way in which I know I have someone that knows how I work, someone that knows me, my work ethic, and I can connect with them. It's pretty easy. It's almost like having the first stage of the interview done. Um, so that works for me. But at the same time, it doesn't work for everybody. Not everyone has that kind of social energy. Not everyone has that desire. So in those situations right there, you do want to use whatever avenues make sense for you. Um, if you do choose to go with just cold applications, you got to make sure you have the right buzzwords in place. They're going to get through an applicant tracking system. And there's multiple websites that can help you with that. Make sure you have your resume or cover letter. That's going to make perfect sense. But go all in on the philosophy that you choose. And Michelle. Yeah, I would say for me within the design industry, it's kind of a mix. It's like cold outreach. Um, for me, I remember I posted on Facebook and a Facebook group called Asian Creative Network. And I just posted in there just thinking if I could find a job, maybe. And then that's how I kind of found my first ever design job. So someone from the company would reach out to me and then I did interviews and then I did contract work and then I got contract to hire. Um, so that's also something that's a possibility that could happen, but it's kind of rare. Um, I would say for those who want to break in, I feel like, of course, you could like mass apply, you could apply for different jobs, different things, um, do the whole kind of normal process when it comes to applying for jobs. But I would say the biggest thing I tell all my like mentees that I've talked to in the past and throughout my career is like rather than trying to push for just applying, I think your experience is going to really help you push further. So when they're asking you those interview questions and kind of talking through your experiences and your work, like you have more experiences to build off of and also talk about and be like, yes, I worked with engineers. Yes, I worked with product managers. Yes, I did the whole process. Here's how I did my design thinking process. Here's how I approached the problem. So, you know, rather than trying to, you know, try to push what you have, but also really get their real life experience. So I tell everybody, go volunteer, literally go to any like tech, you know, type of nonprofit or whatever you do, like even within my nonprofit, profit i have those opportunities for other designers who want to break into things and so um that's something that i try to give more um opportunities for because especially you know for those who for me like i didn't have that at the time um and so i kind of broke into different things different ways you know different you know opportunities and so i actually volunteer with boba talks recommend that community super great um I have a whole design team there, but like you try different things and try new things, especially when it comes to like projects with other friends or like build something together. That's what I ended up doing. We ended up building a mental health app and then that's launching this year. So there's so much you can do with like your friends or like volunteer for like maybe like develop for good right is a really good place to go or benefit.design is a really good space to go to. Um, so I recommend like just volunteer and do those things, gain your real life experience and you'll have more advantage in the interview process because you have more to talk about rather than everybody else just like, oh, I have my case studies for my boot camp. that's all I got. But if you can get that real life experience and do it now, you have so much more to talk about. You have so much more to push on because you know exactly what it's going to look like. And then when you go into that job, it'll look similar, but a little different, but it will still help you like push those experiences further and talk more about it. Fantastic. So that concludes the first section of this panel. I know we've been talking a lot about how to find a job, transferable skills and so forth. 
Now I want to transition into something fun, and maybe this is what everybody came here for today. I want to talk about compensation and benefits, right? Because many of you may not make a move necessarily if the money is not the same. And, you know, we all know that the money is not exactly the same, so it's going to be slightly different. Um, but yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. I want to hear about what it's like to work in your industry, what kind of benefits you get that are similar or dissimilar to tech, you know, such as your dry cleaning or your on-site gyms, if such things even exist. And then I think the biggest question, and I've seen this question come through a few times here in the uh, Q&A, is can you also work from home in your industry? So Michelle, throwing that back to you. Yeah, so I've had a lot of interesting benefits throughout my career. So um, I've had, when I worked in private equity in the financial sector, um, I got equity in the company 10% if I remember correctly. And then I had a really nice gym membership. So it was like for free. So we had like, we were in like a really like high rise office building. Then I had like a gym I could go to, but it was kind of small. You had to like pay money to go, 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 go to it, which was kind of lame. So I was like, okay, never mind. Um, but you got a lot of great snacks. Um, you get like benefits with like transportation, especially in Chicago, like it's expensive. It's the whole entire system with like the um, L train and all that stuff is also um, exciting. So you kind of get those little benefits there. Um, I've also had benefits for like, you know, medical and like dental usual stuff, but like, it's like through like more affordable options. And then they also maybe will like give you, um, other, um, free perks of like, you know, other mental health resources or, you know, more like yoga or something or meditation stuff or whatever the case would be more like kind of more, um, mental health focus or wellness, um, I've also had the benefit of working from home fully remotely, um, had companies where like everybody's all spread out. Maybe we'll travel to the office, maybe like once a quarter or something, we'll all kind of come together and all that stuff. So i um, done that in the past. I've done hybrid. So I'd be like in office, maybe three days, like three days a week and then work from home two days a week. Um, I've done fully on site, but I truly love working from home because I had my doggies with me, obviously. Um, but I do love working from home, but I think there is like ups and downs of it. Um, but I've had nice gyms. I had access to all kinds of other perks and like restaurants or like little discounts or stuff or whatever. Like the company is like truly going to go extra mile for me, I guess. Um, but those are some nice things I've had in the past, but do miss those in Chicago <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> so awesome. Yash. Um, so I, I just actually pinged one of my team members. I think it's a big four awesome gig. But... What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Was someone else talking? No. I sorry, I was, I was just talking to myself. My bad. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. Um, okay, so I actually ping one of my team members uh, right now. So um, she is a she's a returning talent acquisition manager over here. And um, I kind of asked the question on like, what do people normally ask about from a benefits discrepancy perspective? So just to kind of share some of the information that she shared over here. And these are people coming from tech organizations primarily, which is where her focus has been recently. Um, I will say medical, uh, dental, 401k is usually very standard. Uh, my company is essentially one of the 980 schedules. So we work essentially eight, uh, nine out of 10 days. Every other Friday, you're off. And what that kind of does is it allows for Fridays to be a work from home day no matter what. And then we offer one additional work from home day. So that's kind of what our company follows. I usually go into the office Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, and I will say that's pretty typical for some of the oil and gas companies here in Houston. Um, aside from that, you know, I think Michelle kind of touched on like some of the, like we have, we have a gym in our office. So that is good and bad. Um, it does provide an avenue, but not many people actually use it. People have actually stated that our previous benefit, which was access to a gym of their choice is going to be preferred. So that is a change that we're making in the near future as a result of some of the feedback. And I will see as a result of some of the folks that are coming in and providing that feedback as well. So from a benefit standpoint, that's kind of one. From a compensation standpoint, which I always, I always tell people, like some of the things that people, that employees are going to care about or candidates are going to care about the most is going to be compensation and their time off. So when it comes to those two, so when it comes to uh, specifically compensation, I will say at the director and higher level, it's very comparable. Um, now, director levels used to be quite different when it was... Um, a director that was at a tech company versus a director that could be managing a whole division of one particular product in oil and gas. Uh, so I kind of want to keep that in mind, but at the same time, it is kind of good to know your scope might be a little bit larger, 
but at the director, senior director, vice president and higher level, it's very comparable. It's almost a one to one. Um, at levels lower, it's a 0.85 to 1, 0.85 being oil and gas. So when I say 0.85, uh, I just kind of think about this as, as almost 8 tenths or 9 tenths of what your um, compensation would have been uh, for a similar role in tech. So it's not that much lower from that perspective. Um, there might be other industries that are probably better at this uh, than oil and gas and energy in general. But just some kind of numbers for you to even think about how you want to approach future roles. A lot of this does go into the folks that I mentioned previously, the job titles I mentioned previously, like product managers, project managers, uh, data analysts. So keep that in mind. That's These are the people that have transitioned. So that's the data that I have access to at this point. But at the same time, it's, a, um, it's comparable. It's, it's not going to be far off. And oil and gas has a big shift going to renewables at the moment. So there is clearly a need for talent from the tech space. And this is something that we value a lot. Uh, and this isn't the exact question at the moment, but we did talk about this previously on, on kind of what are those transferable skill sets. And really some of these are being framed because of people that are coming in from tech companies at the moment, that we know we need more of that. We know that this is a desire. We know, we know we're gonna need a greater reliance on networks and technology that we don't have at the moment. So it's going to be growing, and we expect it to be growing by almost 300% uh, at the three major oil and gas companies in Houston. Well, Alex. All right. Okay. Just as there are many institutions out there in, in the worldwide, in the 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 worldwide the wide open wide field of uh, financial services, benefits vary by institution. Uh, my particular company. I mean, we're not like a big a big company by any means i mean we do get your standard benefits and i'm a frontline employee so you know standard you know vision health vision dental that kind of stuff what was interesting though was actually i was getting benefits as a part-timer which a lot of companies rarely do uh these days and you know that's kind of the one thing that kind of intrigued me so you know if you're looking to do something that feels more like full-time work but at part-time hours uh financial institution might be able to provide that like you know if you find that hey you know i only can work like 29 hours or 30 some odd hours works better for me because of my schedule or because of you know uh you know i have kids or i have things i want to take care of i mean that might be one benefit i mean that, uh, especially working where i was working um I know some of the big companies, a friend of mine, again, investment banker at Chase, of course, I mean, he, he pretty much flashes on Instagram everything the company does for him. So, I mean, like a, a Chase or a Wells Fargo will definitely provide for their people. Uh, you know, it's not a read. It's just, you know, this is just they have the means to do so. And, of course, these are people bringing in most of the money. So, you know, it just it, it can it, it can correspond to the amount of output that or the amount of input that you're providing to the company. So, again, it just depends, um, you know. So I, I overall I feel like you know competition is is pretty good, but it just depends on again who you're who you're working with and what they're willing to to provide for you too. So um, I uh, and in terms of like pay, again it varies. You know if you if you're one of the people like you know honestly I wanted to go down to part time, maybe have benefits. You know you might have to take a lower pay, but again that's if that's part of your plan right now like you know because some people do want to kind of step down a little bit they they don't want to work you know 40 some odd hours a week they'd rather just go part-time you know to take care of family you know pursue other things but they just need something to pay the bills you know i just it just really depends um but uh yeah i mean my company's been pretty good about taking care of the member the mem the team members for the most part so i mean i have really I, I don't have a family of my own to take care of so i really don't have much to complain about but again just depends on the company that you work for but awesome. compensation is everywhere so again but again the the people that are going to get paid the six figures those are going to be more of like your like like any company but definitely like your high performers the high performing investment guys for example or your high performing mortgage people which again, I that industry is kind of impacted right now. But you know, when times are good, yeah. yeah. Josh. All right. Uh, yeah. So I was thinking back on the last eight years of my experience between a couple of companies and people that I know have worked elsewhere in my industry. So within the health and health wellness industry, natural products as a whole, you know, it, it's going to vary. Um, if you're living more like inland, maybe the Midwest, the Rust Belt, the parts of the Sun Belt, 
um things might not be as high in terms of the the uh compensation scale but if you're for example like say you're in southern california where i'm at um pay is pretty decent actually um it might not be quite the same as say the bay area if i'm guessing probably a lot of you are from the bay area so you know if you're in marketing and you're making say 200k you could probably expect around 160 in like los angeles san diego or orange county um so kind of i say take a 30 ish the 40k kind of bump down from the bay area if that makes any sense um so if you're making 250 you think like closer to two if you're making 150 you think closer to 110 115 um and i would extract that across all kinds of roles whether that's graphic design videography product marketing brand manager etc um, and then it also will change on the size of company too just like anywhere else as um, far as scheduling um it's very popular still being hybrid um, i think covid changed a lot of things and companies still embrace that so like i've had a monday friday remote kind of setup and then tuesday wednesday thursday in the office Personally, in my industry, I think this is good. Um, I think there's times to be together. And especially if you're making physical products and you're not just marketing invisible things to the world, um, it's kind of helps to get together and actually see what you're doing. Like, oh yeah, we actually make this. Oh yeah, we actually make this. Like we have to like look at the label. We have to make sure it's working. Does this smell right? Does it taste right? I have to get a sample of the 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 sleeve, you know, like how can I show that to my team if they're all remote and they can't see and feel it like the the edges that you know is it embossed right is is there you know uh it's it, did it come out right was oh that edge didn't come out like how we planned on it you know so there's time to be together um but then there's times to focus and that's where the kind of the hybrid comes part is on the front and back end um there's a lot of your your personal time at least how we structure it like your mondays your fridays that's the for at least for me that's where i focus on my personal stuff the middle of the week's collaboration meetings whatever you got to do you know those kind of things. Um, in terms of kind of perks, um, PTO is pretty good. You, you'll generally start anywhere from 15 to 20 days and kind of go up there with seniority. Um, in my industry, you see a lot of people that you'll get more days the longer you stay. Um, my industry likes stability, um, likes people staying there. I In my company, I have people that have been there 10, 20, 30, 40 years, like in my company. Um, the whole families have been working at the company for 10, 20, 30 years. Like it's like generational. So that kind of stuff's also welcome depending on where you live and those kind of companies. Um, and then I'd say, you know, other things you, you'll even see within the industry, like they'll, they'll treat you like there's snacks in the fridge. I went to, I went to a Dodgers baseball game the other day with the team. Like I didn't have to pay for it. You know, like my manager got us all tickets on the company. Me. I've done that in the past, go out, eat lunches, all that fun stuff. So there's a lot of good things. You have the other things like matching 401k, your perks, your dental, your vision paid for. Um, so a lot of things I think would carry over from tech in certain aspects. It's just the, you know, it's just a different, a little bit of a different lifestyle. Um, but if, you know, if you're in the Bay Area you and you want to do different things, there's a chance you might need to leave, but be at least be open to certain areas. Um, you know, Southern California is a good place. Um, if you don't want to totally leave the West Coast, other uh, good places with talent networks or Austin. If you're wanting to live, work in, kind of be around tech, but get into the other industries, that's a good area. Um, the Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina area where the Research Triangle Park is, that's another area to consider if if you want to move. There's every, there is tech there, but there's other things. There's biotech. There's there's manufacturing. There's healthcare. There's financial services as well. Um, so those are a few other hot spots that I would recommend if you're thinking. And then there's Miami as well. Um, that really kind of grew um, with lots of industries moving down there from the last four years because of COVID and all that stuff. So, yeah, that's a little bit. Love it. All right. So uh, with benefits aside, I wanted to talk about something that I think is the other thing that a lot of folks came here today for as well, which is artificial intelligence. AI, as you know, is supposed to take all of our jobs so that we can do the fun things in life, like art, enjoyment, and our hobbies. It may not seem like that, actually, though, given where things are headed, but nonetheless, it's a big, big part of our conversation. I'd like to know, with tech people so afraid of AI taking over their jobs, if they're coming over to your industry, how is AI impacting what's going on in your field? 
Josh, start with you. Yeah, um, we actually just had an AI training company wide actually the other day on how to use Microsoft Copilot across the whole organization. Um, so, you know, because we have a lot of even the manufacturing floor in the plants, like, you know, a lot of those people don't really use their computer on day to day kind of basis in terms of work because they're they're creating actual products on on the line. But but we still want them to have the ability to use AI and skill up over time. So, you know, for example, my company embraces it. We embrace it in terms of improving your own personal productivity around planning. Um, we use it a lot internally for like summarizing meetings. So like what was talked about, like there's in manufacturing, there's a lot of process involved. Like there's a lot of moving parts, literally. And there's a lot of people involved trying to bring a product to the market. You know, just like tech, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of coding, but then that physical product, like something like this, there's a lot that goes on. There, there's microbiologists involved. There's innovation scientists. There's formulators. There's planners. There's supply chain analysts. There's marketers. There's salespeople, like there's all kinds of people that make this thing right here come to fruition. And so, you know, using AI is going to just help as long as you, you know, you're in a place that it has a, it, it's not trying to replace you, but support you. So, you know, that's something I would, you know, if you're interviewing, like ask like what their, their philosophy is on it. And you, you'll probably get a feeling of that, especially if you're talking like a head of HR, they'll kind of tell you one way or another, if they're embracing it and to help the employees or they're finding ways to, you know, cut corners or like be more uh, efficient. So you want to look for like certain keywords. Um, but at least in my industry, or at least at this point, it's AI is really about empowering right now and making us more productive. Um, like my company doesn't want to get rid of anybody because of AI. We want to empower the people, make them more productive. And yeah, maybe over time you don't hire as many people, but we want to maintain what what kind of uh, internal uh, intellectual property we do have. Like we don't want people to leave for what we do because those are specialized skills that are hard to like let go of. Like making a gummy vitamin might seem silly, but that's a very complicated process <laughs> to like get that done right. Like there is a science and an art to it. And I'm, I've been there four months. I still don't understand all of it. Like, but there's a lot of design behind it. There's a lot of like thought technical stuff behind it so ai might help us even in that avenue we have, i don't know if we really went into that venture yet but that's that's what i have to say about ai so awesome uh alex are you there right here i was just answering some questions for the on the chat oh, um no yeah so actually it was kind of funny because a lot of institutions are dealing with ai on two fronts um there, I, I overall, I I see not necessarily. I don't know if I want to call it a reluctance to embrace AI because again, you're you're looking at an ancient and uh, kind of eldritch kind of industry that's been around for a long time. So when you have that 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 history, you tend to not embrace certain technologies as fast as others. Although I do see it maybe at the customer level where they're kind of using it to help like customers, like on the offset. Um, but I know that it's pro my kind of prediction is that they are definitely going to start ramping up, especially when you realize that um, AI is actually being used by fraudsters to target institutions. So there's definitely going to be, I mean, I could definitely see the design, the need for people with expertise in AI and especially AI and security, because um now you can take anyone's voice using AI and impersonate someone over the phone. So like, for example, I can take any, you know, we, we have the technology to replicate your voice, Albert. We can call, you know, Chase, pretend to be you and pretty much get your banking information. So that's what we're kind of dealing with, with AI in that kind of regard. Uh, but I, I in my particular company, I haven't seen, huge widespread adoption of AI in a very noticeable kind of level. Uh, probably more rudimentary like bots and things like that where you we're, we're starting to use that to just kind of just answer questions for team members and stuff like that. But I don't see, I, I eventually we're going to have to basically answer the door on AI at some point. And, and depending on whether or not it's going to replace us, uh, you know, basically me as a customer facing person, 
I again I go back to the reminder, and I think Yash might have hit up on this point too, that you know, there's definitely that emotional component that people and might have to deal with. Like you gotta remember, like I told you, money is a very emotional thing, you know, like I, and you know, when you wake up one morning and again find out that you lost 20% of your stock your stock earnings over a little much, I mean how you feel is going to dictate you is going to probably dictate more of what you're going to do versus, you know, the actual numbers. So I don't think AI, I don't think AI now is, I mean, it doesn't feel like it now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure at some point it's, it's, it's going to, most institutions are going to have to use it uh, in conjunction with actual human interaction, especially if we're talking about, uh, if we're talking about uh, customer facing roles. Yep. Yes. So oil and gas in general is embracing AI for a lot of different purposes. Um, so I can kind of talk about an HR perspective over here. Uh, if I think about some follow learning and development and compliance training that takes place. So very recently, we have also adopted Copilot. We went through Copilot training. Uh, we're using Microsoft's version of it, and we were able to index our entire organization. So our entire knowledge management database has now been uploaded, which is great because now we can just ask questions. Um, I can I can literally upload a spreadsheet and just ask questions as opposed to running VLOOKUPs, which is awesome. Um, most of my team members are t uh, trained up on this as well. So from an application perspective, we are embracing it. Uh, there are some other avenues that it opens up, though, and um, there's always going to be a human element needed to translate anything that AI does, anything that anything automatic, automatically generated is going to do for you. There's going to be a conversion, there's going to be a translation. And what we're doing at the moment is kind of ensuring that we have people that are capable of knowing that. They're not specialized. Someone mentioned this earlier. They are generalists in the field. They know something from start to finish. They know a process flow, process flow from start to finish. And that's huge. So uh, my organization has also started using AI for recruiting purposes. So like finding the best candidates, we upload 25 resumes and we're able to see based off this role, where would they be a good match? And then additionally, if they're not a good match for this role, where else could they potentially fit in if we consider them top talent or top candidates that we wanna hire? So from that perspective, um, AI is being adopted. I personally also use AI for a lot of different reasons. So not just resume writing that I mentioned previously, Resume writing is going to be a big use for probably a lot of people out here. Um, don't be afraid to just upload the actual job uh, requisition and your resume and ask for AI to do it for you. Bing has a version that's free as long as you have an account with Hotmail or Outlook, um, and you can use that seamlessly. I've used OpenAI for a long time, but I just very recently deviated away from it, and I've gone into Copilot Pro for both personal and business use. So I would highly recommend using that for anything that you need. Um, it can also be used to target specific jobs that you're looking for. So like, I mean, state what your skill set is or what you're looking for and get it to find open requisitions for you at this point in time. It's going to be your friend. Don't, uh, don't fight it in any way. Uh, and I definitely don't believe it's going to be replacing the majority of jobs that exist anytime in our lifetimes. Hmm. Michelle. Yeah, um, kind of connecting with everybody else said too. I kind of agree. It's like, you know, AI, it's it's definitely emerging. It's changing the way we kind of think about things, the way we approach our jobs. But I don't think it's going to replace us entirely, especially with what we, you know, built up upon as humans before AI kind of became so popular and so used. I think there is still part of us that is still doing the human functions of jobs rather than like trying to have everything replace something. And then that's going to be that job and then that's gone and you know we're kind of out of the equation but i think there is so much opportunity for us to use ai and i use it like sparingly for like you know researching some things looking up something or googling something maybe asking a really dumb question that i would google but like i thought why not i ask it and see how it goes um but you know especially for my industry too like i think we utilize ai just a little bit when it comes to like um you know summarizing things or maybe like maybe job search stuff or maybe resume tailoring maybe just some ways to kind of make things more stronger more um maybe more key like words or phrases to use especially with job searching or like even putting your resume through ats systems and you know when they're using ai and how do we get kind of more in front of the recruiters and all that stuff and so i think you know i've used it for job searching in the past too like way back um and i think there is opportunity for ai to be utilized within my industry but i feel like you know with you know as a being a designer like we still need that human component which is us 
as a designer and the AI can only do so much. So it could maybe just organize some research we've done, but it can't replace, you know, all the things that we need to do as humans. So um, I think it's not really a threat. I think embrace it like everybody else is saying, but I would say don't, don't be feared by it. I think it's only going to do so much for us, but it, it can't replace us entirely. I don't think so. Yeah. All right. We're getting to the end here. So I'm going to have two more questions before we conclude. Um, so, you know, I think AI is one of the threats that tech people feel is facing their industry. I think another aspect that is also compelling and really impactful lately that I've been seeing a lot of is ageism. And along with ageism also come layoffs. And so the question I want to ask you is, and we've touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to just jump into it is, um, what does ageism and really the, amount, the, the age of people in your industries look like? Does ageism exist? And if your companies do layoffs within your industry, why do layoffs happen? And what should tech people look out for so that they don't uh, hit that level of uh, of whiplash again in a new in a new place? Michelle. Uh, yeah, um, I feel like, you know, with age, I feel like, you know, everybody's like scared of age, you know, I'm this age, can I start breaking into this? Can I still do this? And, you know, me, I'm very young, I'm probably still most baby here, obviously, <laughs> in my early 20s still. So I feel like there is so much you now with me, you know, when I started working in tech, you know, I was 19, 18 at the time, did full time roles by like 19. And then from there just kept going. And I feel like, you know, age doesn't matter as long as you know what you're doing and you know your knowledge and your skill sets and everything else. And I've been laid off. I've been, you know, moved jobs. I've changed things. I've done, you know, all kinds of roles, all kinds of, you know, industries and stuff and tried new things. And so don't let age hold you back. I feel like nobody's too young to break into tech. No one's too young to do this and that. And we're still, you know, figuring out what we want to do and what careers we want to do. And everybody's, you know, doing things for so long, but they want to try something new. That's totally okay. And age shouldn't really be a factor into that. I feel like with age and um, how things are changing over time, I don't think it matters, you know, especially for me, like I've done lead roles with within still being in college I've done you know full-time roles and agency work and SAS and I'm still in college and I graduated college last year in December so there is so much you can do at such a young age or even like whatever age you are so honestly age is just a number but it doesn't change how much knowledge and how capable we are of doing so many things and changing the way we impact the world so I would say don't I don't hold you back. I'm I'm young. I'm still going. Everybody else is still going. So you have so much opportunity in front of you. So don't hold back. I've done crazy things, <laughs> done crazy jobs and still keep going. So just keep going. It's okay. Love it. Yes. So I should hold up some numbers. Um, I'm glad you went to Michelle first over there. So what I'm going to do is kind of share um, some statistics over here around the folks that have been coming into oil and gas, so coming into my company anyways. And um, retention rates and such have been pretty positive all around, so probably not much to share out there. But the average age has been 44. So I'm not sure if that's good or bad or what that means to people over here, but 44 is the average age. And just kind of looking at like the different ways in which that's split out as well, we don't really have any major outliers um, as a result of that. We have a couple of folks that came in at 19, which probably do bring that number down, if anything. Um, but 44 is that average age. So when I kind of think about um, ageism in the workplace, especially in oil and gas, it's not going to be that much of a factor. It's not a factor at all in energy, to be fair. Uh, most of the folks uh, that work in energy are going to be here because they care about their, um, their future, their retirement, and want to secure that future. So um, I try to think about some of the folks that I've directly been been involved in hiring as well. And I would say they have been probably on that 44 or older side. So I don't think age should be a factor at all. I also don't think that you should kind of keep that as a factor when you're looking at a field at all. Alex. You're on mute again. Yep. Definitely, um, definitely in the, I'm, I'm using the, the headset, so I, my other one was a little bit easier to use. Okay, so my, my apologies. But definitely ageism is not really an issue in our industry. Um, in fact, I think it's probably one of the few industries where being older can kind of help you, uh, depending on, of course, experience. You know, that's kind of the big thing. 
Um, like for, you know, there's, I mentioned earlier, there's different roles, different, uh, different opportunities. Like for example, uh, most of the more seasoned underwriters in our, in our team, in our team that work for both the mortgage team and the, the consumer lending team, they're a little bit more on the middle age to the older side. So they're kind of, they're almost pushing 50. Uh, I mean, not our company, but just in general, but they, be, but because again, uh, underwriting is a form of risk management. Um, it helps to have that experience to kind of guide you on making a decision of whether or not a loan will be extended to somebody. So uh, but I tend to see some longevity in that field. Um, some of the best advisors, uh, some of the more, uh, some of the more, some of the advisors that I mentioned earlier, uh, they tend to be more around 50, 55. So those, those people, tend to have been advising clients for over maybe 30 years and they're still advising clients and same thing with like any any sort of advisory capacity it, it, from what i've observed uh more mature individuals tend to still thrive because you have that level of maturity because also too it's much easier for a lot of people to talk to someone who's closer in age to them about their assets and what they're going to do with them because they understand, you know, that how important it's going to be for them once they enter the age of retirement. But overall, I mean, especially where I worked, I've never gotten the vibe that once you're over 50, you get put out the pasture. And I don't usually see that in the industry in general, because again, it does really, it does really, um, depend on again it comes always boils down to experience and it, it boils down to uh how long have you been doing this and how how successful have you been doing this and of course if you've been doing this long and successfully um i mean you can do this until you decide you retire you know yeah josh yeah i'll say on my side of the industry specifically manufacturing anything on that side age is a non-issue um, I'll say I am the youngest director in the history of my company by 10 years of age. Everyone else is like 10 years plus um, at my level. Um, managers, I see all over the spectrum, young, old, everything in between, even on, even to the, the, the manufacturing floor. I mean, you know, there, there's obviously the entry level positions, you know, anyone can come in at any age. Um, my company has people that have been there 30 plus years, whole families working within the company in different departments. Um, so it just depends. Um, um, you know, I, I would say in like the health and wellness industry, maybe on the brand side, sometimes there might be a little bit of ageism, just depending on the type of co company and the culture. Like if you look at the brand vibe and, you know, it's like, say it's a, a very up and coming kind of hip brand, like, um, you know, prime energy you know you see that like that's really geared to young people you're going to see more young people working that kind of company at least in the consumer kind of facing roles and things like that um it just kind of depends you know brand to brand more on the on the brand side um but more on the technical side where i'm at um anyone any age can thrive in any kind of role and um you know you don't you don't have to look pretty you don't have to look handsome like it's all about <laughs> character qualification you know, so like, it doesn't matter, you know, if you, you're, you're skinny as heck, you're big as heck, like, it doesn't matter. Everything's welcome and everyone's welcome. All kinds of types of people, whatever, uh, what, everyone under the sun, like I, I've seen everything where I'm at and it's, it's a really diverse uh, group of people and I love it. So that's what I would have to say. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we are heading towards the end here. So I wanted to uh, really close this with some really good comments and thoughts here. Uh, as we end this today's panel, number one, I want to thank all of you panelists for joining us. I think it's so insightful to have you here and you've shared a lot of really great information for those who may be looking to transition into a new field. And so to close, I want to offer or ask, have you ask two things, answer two things. Uh, number one is uh, what final thoughts do you have for those who may be transitioning from tech? And number two, uh, is your company hiring right now? And where can folks get in touch with you? Uh, maybe even outside of the LinkedIn profiles that I'm about to share. Josh, we'll kick you off to end it here. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I'll say yes up front. My company is hiring. I'm more on the planning supply chain side of things at this stage. Um, we actually had a job fair on site today. So, 
Um, we have about 26 roles open. Um, a, quite a number of those are at very entry level. So unless you want to, you know, get very, very, very entry level kind of foot in, um, a lot of the jobs are manufacturing floor, whether it's creating the actual products you see in, in the machines, working with a lot of machinery, process-based kind of stuff. But then there are planners, buyers, supply chain, master scheduling. So th those kind of analytical kind of roles, I guess, if you will, some financial, you know, aspects to it with the buying, everything like that. Um, what was the second part of your question, Albert? I, I forgot. Uh, just uh, final insights you have for folks who are working in tech and yeah. uh, where, what, what you, what you want to tell them as they embark on their journey. Yeah, I would say uh, probably making a move from tech and especially if you're in the barrier, like that, that's a big deal. It's a big move. It's a big lifestyle change. Um, you're probably wondering, well, can I stay here? It's it's possible. You could probably stay where you're at. Um, but I'd, I'd also encourage you to be open to change, be open to new opportunities. Um, you might never know what's on the other side. Um, I, we, I used to be on the comfort side of where I used to live on the other side of the country. Um, but, you know, thanks to Albert, I'm actually here in California doing what I do today. <laughs> For him, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now, and I wouldn't have the dream job of my life, even though I wanted to be in tech. I'm not in tech, um, but look, here I am here today talking. So anything's possible um, if you believe in yourself, have a good character, and uh, just you want to see the best for people around you. Um, it's not all about just, at least from my experience and what I do around what I do, it's not all about just self elevation. It's it's making everything better for everyone around you. So if that's something that you like to do, consider the change. Awesome, Alex. All right, uh, we. Um, I mean, my company's definitely hiring. Um, if you're wondering, I do see some tech positions open. Uh, there's also some operations uh, as well. And of course, if you're looking to just completely move away from corporate and just want to do something up in the front with with members and just, you know, like sometimes, you know, you just you want to start kind of going in a different direction. Definitely our front facing retail positions. We definitely have them all throughout the Bay area. So uh, definitely hiring. I would say, like what Josh said earlier, definitely. Um, if you're making a change from an industry you've known, you've been in so well been in a long time to something that you may not be familiar with you will have to be comfortable with getting uncomfortable here there's just no way around it and i mean recently i and i taught and i talked to albert about this recent like about six months ago when i got i got the role that i got you know i was very uncomfortable because it was a pilot role that i have no one's ever done before i was basically the first person and i was very uncomfortable six months in it's amazing so but you kind of have to give yourself that chance to be uncomfortable. You have to be willing. And this is also when I tell my clients who are trying to radically change how they, how they spend money and how they save, you know, you have to be, you're going to, you're going to be uncomfortable for a while. I can't, I wish I could take that away from you, but I can't, you're just going to have to deal with it. And, but I promise you one way or another, you will find something, you will pull something from that experience and you will be, miles ahead of where you are now one way or another and it's also too this is also a, this is also a, the change process again you may try applying for stuff it may not work out or you may land something and then find out it's not going to work out again you're keep keep going you know keep trying you know keep keep applying even if you do land a gig turns out nope not the one just don't don't hate yourself don't punish yourself just just you know Find a new gig and keep moving until you land where you want to be. Okay. Love it. Yes. That was very well said, Alex. Um, so there are so many translatable skill sets from tech to oil and gas specifically, but other worlds as well. And that goes for the consulting field as well. I know we didn't really talk about that a whole lot, but I think consulting is going to be a very popular place for people from the tech industry to go not just because of the pay, the lifestyle, but also because of the type of work that you do and the problem solving aspect. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, but the one little plug for oil and gas over here is it, it's not your father's oil and gas anymore. The chemistry has changed. The focus has changed. Renewables are the priority. Um, so like what excited me about the organization that I've joined is the fact that we are not just making gas anymore. We are looking at aromatics, we're looking at base oils, we're looking at plastics, we're looking at so many different avenues in which um, oil and gas can be productive, 
we're looking at carbon emission um, reduction and what that looks like. And that's a massive department for us at the moment that I very recently created. It's about, so it's about 120 folks. And I will say that's maybe about six to 7% of our organization, a new department that we created only dedicated to carbon reduction at this point in time. So think about oil and gas from that perspective. That's just my organization, but you have major companies like Chevron and ExxonMobil that are doing the exact same thing. And they're gonna be very competitive in that space. They're looking for talent and tech. So no one over here should be disheartened in any way. You have options that are out there. You have hybrid options, you have remote options, you have in-person options. It just depends on what you wanna focus on at this point in time. Awesome, and uh, what are you hiring for right now? Uh, so some of our major openings have been filled, which are the ones that I mentioned previously around product and project management, but uh, a lot of engineering roles at this point, a lot of change management roles, a lot of SAP implementation roles, which is a big project we're undertaking. So, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to share. I'm more than happy to look at your LinkedIn and see what roles might make sense too. Awesome. And then finally, Michelle. Um, I would say something that I want to encourage is always just try new experiences, always try new things. And tech is one of those industries where it's competitive for sure. Every industry is probably competitive in its own way, but I feel like there is so much opportunity for you to try new things and grow from different experiences. And so whether you want to break into design, whether you want to break into other industries, try new things, go for that. Don't worry about age. Don't worry about the skills you may not have. As long as you have the passion, as long as you have the skills that you can transform others jobs you've had in the past or other skills that you want to learn and you show that you know to you know the hiring manager recruiter whichever way you do it there is so much opportunity for you to try new things and so age doesn't matter experience is not going to hurt you as long as you you know push towards those experiences you can gain those experiences on your own so I would say keep pushing keep growing keep doing things I'm young everybody else has time to do things you got time to do things 2024 is your year but you know we're like half we're like pretty much closer to the end of the year but i feel like there's so much you can do at any age so don't hold back that's what i would say all right no love it yeah 2024 can still be your year i mean especially since we have three and a half months left so uh everybody thank you again so much for offering your insights today thank you so much for spending the last hour and a half with us i'm hoping that everybody who's watching here has learned a little bit about what it's like to work in some different industries outside of tech. I've dropped their LinkedIn's into uh, into the into the webinar chat here, so I encourage you to connect, to network, and see what the possibilities are for you. As uh, also, we also have a recording of this that will go live. We will follow up over Eventbrite, and we're going to do this again in a few months' time. So, if there are any industries that you're looking for, any people that you'd like to meet. Let me know. I'll go find them. I'll go put the panel together and we'll see whether it is indeed time for you to go quit tech and find something else. Without further ado, have a wonderful rest of your evening. We will talk to you soon and have a wonderful rest of your week as well. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.